Support for Illinois lawmakers comes from the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute at Southern Illinois University, Carbondale. Information available at paulsimoninstitute.org. Welcome back to Illinois Lawmakers' continuing coverage of the Illinois General Assembly during the month of May. I'm Jack Titchener, along with Rich Miller of CapitalFacts.com. Rich, uh, quite a bit going on here in the building this week. The Senate Democrats uh, moved several pieces of the grand bargain uh, across the rotunda to the Illinois House of Representatives. Right, but it doesn't really mean anything because none of these bills are going to get signed into law if by some magic they even pass the House. So they passed a $36.5 billion budget for the year, but they didn't pass the revenue measures to go behind it. Right. Um, it would be kind of politically foolish to pass a huge tax increase with only Democrats. Um, and the Senate president admitted yesterday that he needs Republican votes for this. <coughs> Excuse Republican. me, and the only way they're going to get Republican votes, sorry to cut you up, the only way they're going to do this is to get an agreement on non-budget items. Right, and probably at the top of that list is property taxes, as you pointed it's out. It's basically it, right? Everything else on the list is solvable. They're very close on everything else if they just apply themselves for a few minutes. So the property tax thing is the Senate Democrats were willing to go for a two-year freeze. Senate Republicans are in agreement for a four-year freeze. Well, it started out as a five-year freeze. That's what the governor wanted. Right. Well, the governor wanted permanent, right? Well, originally, yeah, but he came up with this idea of five-year property tax freeze in exchange for a five-year income tax increase. Right. He narrowed that down to four and four. Uh, the Senate president negotiated uh, over the details on the four and four uh, and then announced that he was only supporting a two-year yesterday. Um, so they have to get this done. If they don't get this done, the rest of it is just all a moot point. The, the thing is, there are a lot of Democrats that don't want to give Rauner a win. Okay. Going into 2018. And a four-year property tax freeze would be a win. I mean, the, the dude would take a, a year and a half long li victory lap over doing that. Uh, and, they, and the Democrats know this, so that's part of it. Uh, the other part is there's some serious you know, issue concerns with some of the more financially troubled schools and local governments freeze their property taxes and, well, you're going to really hurt those governments. Um, it's difficult to see which is weighing the most here, um, but uh, I do know that it's not going to get solved until they solve this issue and right now it's intractable and everything else like workers compensation reform school funding reform a lot of those things are probably doable workers comp is right there they were I wide mean, been apart been for weeks right and i think the governor has governor has moved toward the democrats on this um uh school funding reform is so complicated it's really difficult to say you know there's a lot of spin out there we don't really know you know, um, maybe they don't even know some of it, right? Um, because it is so complicated. Uh, but it's, it's, I think they can get that done. That is one of those things where it's just like, if everything else is, if the train is moving, okay, then that stuff gets done. All that stuff gets done. But the train is not moving because property tax freeze has not been decided upon. And we've still got about 12 days to go before uh, we're out of here on the 31st. Good luck in uh, getting this home. Yeah, right. <laughs> Somebody needs to figure out how to land this plane. Rich Miller, thanks very much. Always good to hear your insights on things. All eyes have been focused on the Illinois Senate and trying to pass the grand bargain. But there's a bipartisan group of House lawmakers wanting action, too. We'll hear from them next.
The Illinois Senate remains center stage in efforts to end the state's nearly two-year-old uh, budget impasse, but a bipartisan group of 30 House members recently signed on to a letter urging the Senate to pass the grand bargain package of bills over here to the House so that they could work on it. Two of the House members now join us on Illinois Lawmakers, Assistant House Majority Leader Elaine Neckertz, Democrat of Northbrook, and Republican State Representative Terry Bryant of Murfreesboro. Good to have you both on the program. Nice to be here today, Jack. Thanks, Jack. Um, Representative Neckertz, you're one of 17 House Democrats who uh, signed on the letter represented Bryant, one of 13 House Republicans. How did this whole thing get started? Where did the, where did the uh, energy start to build to try to get something done here? As you might imagine, there are we, we, lawmakers actually do speak to each other, and so a, we there are bipartisan, bicameral groups that come together and say, well, what can we do uh, as rank and file House members to, uh, to to push this process along? And one of the things we heard from the Senate is, well, would be helpful to know the feeling in the House and and whether there's support for something like the grand bargain in the House. And uh, so uh, we set about trying to get some folks on board to sign a letter. I, I would say certainly on the Democratic side, we didn't have enough time to get to all 71 members. Had we d had time, I think there would have been a, f a number more that would have been willing to sign on. So most recent, I, I just came on most recently uh, in the last week or so. I think the group was, was meeting maybe for a few weeks or so, kind of laid the groundwork and then came to a few more of us and said, you know, we'd like to expand this a little bit uh, and then found that there was a lot more support. Uh, so I think, you know, maybe we'll have some others that will join in uh, a little later. But we definitely wanted to send a message to the Senate side that um, we want to see something. You know, it's very, we're divided government. So we want to know where their minds are and I'm sure they want to know where our minds are. And then we can get to work on something that, that we can have bipartisan support on. So in some ways this is a, a public show of support to uh, both the Senate and and everyone watching this whole process around the state that we really want to get something done we're behind you on uh, on this we'll get into the details when this thing comes over to the house but we really want to see something done here I, I just want us to be careful sometimes we can get into a mode of get something done even if it's wrong and that's what we want to watch for we want to make sure that uh, I, I think that in, on the Senate side, they put some components together that are that we can certainly agree on. Some other components that's going to take a little bit of work. So I don't want them to just send us something because they're in a hurry to get it done. I'd like them to continue to work on a couple areas. But we certainly, I, I hope we have sent them a message that we're willing to work with them. And clearly, I think now that they, they've sent us a message saying we are working on this and here's what we have so far. Representative Neckritz. Well, as you said, uh, you know, the, most of the focus has been on the Senate. Right. So th the House had been relatively silent in the, on this, and but we didn't want that silence to indicate that we weren't interested or didn't care what the Senate was doing or thought th or thought that the whole thing mm -hmm. was bad. We wanted to let them know and the governor know as well that the work being done there uh, had, you know, was important to the House, and we would like to we'd like to see them take action. How much of this is a reflection of your individual districts? You're from the Northbrook area, suburban Chicago. You're from Southern Illinois, and largely rural district. How much of the, how much of this is a reflection of the impact of the impasse back in your respective home districts? Well, certainly it ha has had an impact everywhere, uh, and I think if you look at the folks that signed on, uh, they're they're not. They're, they're not a monolith or they're not homogenous. It, it is a, a range of folks from all over the state, different ethnicities, different backgrounds. So I don't think it's a, necessarily just a reflection of the types of different districts that uh, Representative Bryant and I represent. It, it was, it, you know, I looked at the picture after we took the picture of the yep. people who had already signed on it, and it was very encouraging to, to see such a diverse group come together. Um, we, we do have really diverse districts. I mean, I have a university in my district, and as you know, is really hurting. Um, and I think that, I'm, I'm glad that Representative Necris and I are doing this together because for my mind here as a, you know, a freshman member a year ago, um, Representative Neckertz was very helpful in helping me get Molly's law passed. Um, not that, you know, uh, she, she helped to, to basically explain to some of her members because she has a better law background than I do. And, um, and we can work really closely together even if we come from very different areas of the state. There's a lot of that that goes on and uh, certainly behind the, behind the scenes that doesn't necessarily, uh, you don't see that out here, but I see a lot of uh, 
uh, cross-pollination across the, mm -hmm. the, the various aisles. You know, it's interesting, um, you, you both kind of brought up the idea that this is a uh, interesting blend of both veteran and relative uh, newcomers to, to the place. A lot of the names on the Democratic side come from a group of uh, female lawmakers who've been very active in the last few months. Uh, could you get, tell me a little bit more about the group? There's, there's a number of the signatories on this who have been working on and caring deeply about the uh, uh, budgetary issues, and they'd like to also contrast that on the Republican side. Uh, well, you know, we, we, there, there have been some women that have come together to talk about these kinds of things over the course of the last couple of years. Uh, and so uh, it, I think it's, you know, there, I, don't, I wouldn't say that the men are uninterested in that. It's just that that's where uh, some, some natural alliances occur. Uh, and, and there's been a, more discussion uh, around a group of friends as to how we move this forward. So, you know, um, I talked about this uh, several times in speeches that I've done, that women tend to be more wired for consensus building. So sometimes we can get together and lay a framework that allows some of our other members who are gender different than we are to come on board uh, because the groundwork is, is laid. And in, in, uh, so, I, you know, I mean, we've, we've seen it nationally uh, in a budget crisis, you know, in Congress when the women members got together and kind of, you know, it isn't that we're smarter or better or whatever, it's just we tend to build consensus a little bit more effectively. The, uh, the letter is a little short, though, on detail about what needs to be in the package coming over from the Senate uh, in terms of a grand bargain. You're not going to just rubber stamp whatever comes flying over the transom from the other side. You want to actually dig into it and, and, and see that this is a good bill for the state of Illinois overall. We, we certainly didn't want to be dictating to the Senate what we needed in the House before they were actually done with their work. Uh, so we were, intent, we were careful in the language we used about uh, what, what we, we didn't want to include anything specific in case the Senate didn't do that and it, then it looks like a non-starter. We, we were very careful in crafting that language. You know, recently uh, I was um, kind, kind of quoted as saying I didn't want to make a comment on the budget. Uh, the reason for that was I didn't want to get in the way of what the Senate is trying to put together. So we want to continue to send a message to them that we're willing to work on this. You know, it's it is sausage making. So we're going to have there's going to be things that uh, Representative Neckerts and I are going to agree on and some things that we're not going to agree on. So it's really just a matter of finding out do we have enough support on each bill to get it passed in both houses and will the governor sign it? The Senate, of course, this week is uh, largely across uh, on uh, party lines moved pieces of the grand bargain over, sometimes not with enough votes to withstand a gubernatorial veto. Um, the, some of the principal differences seem to be along the uh, lines of a, a property tax freeze. The Senate Democrats were willing to go for a two-year two freeze. The Senate Republicans said no, it had to be at least four years. The governor wanted it to be permanent. Is that one of the, you think that's going to be one of the major hang-ups when it comes over here? It's really hard for me to predict what will be the hangups when it comes over here. Uh, I could imagine that property taxes is a, is, would be one of those, but there, there, are, there will be undoubtedly be plenty of others as well. Yeah, I know in, in Jackson County in particular, um, I think they're the seventh highest property taxed county in the state. They'd like to have some property tax relief, in particular in Carbondale. But I've been hesitant to jump on board with uh, a property tax freeze until we have funding, uh, a funding change for our schools. So until we're less reliant on that property tax, it's difficult to vote on a property tax freeze. Yeah, I'm glad you raised that because that's another, that's another hang up. The version of the school uh, funding reform bill that passed mm -hmm. out yesterday still has uh, problems on the Republican side of the aisle because of the block grants that go to the city of Chicago. Mm -hmm. So to, just to speak to that, the issue isn't whether or not the students in Chicago need, need money. The issue is students all over the state need money. And if we give a block grant to the Chicago students, that's hundreds of millions of dollars that we believe should be dispersed throughout the entire state. You know, I have Elkville in the district, and at one point Elkville was down to 87, I think it was 87 or $89 in the bank. No zeros behind it. You know, so we all have poor schools, and we want to make sure that our schools are equitably funded. 
I also think that education funding reform has been sort of a third rail uh, of uh, legislative action around here. I, you know, I, it's been, I think, a couple decades since we took a serious look at the education funding formula. So to even get a vote on something, whether it's partisan or nonpartisan or, or, or close to being bipartisan, to even get to that stage where you have a vote, I think, is a major accomplishment. And it shows that there is some really good progress on that to address the issues that we're all facing with districts um, back home. Uh, and so I'm pleased that it's even gotten this I, far. I think we're very close yeah. on, on pretty much all of the issues. It just, uh, you know, a week isn't a lot of time, but you know, here in Springfield, it could be a lot of it's time. time. <laughs> right. I've, I've seen things move in a matter of uh, hours. Eight, eight hours or a yeah. dozen yes. hours. Yes. Yes. Representative Neckritz, Representative Bryant, thanks very much for your time. On thanks the for having us We certainly appreciate it. Good to have you thanks both. Thanks so much, Jack. Still ahead on uh, the program, lawmakers are working together on another issue, and that's combating the state's problems with human trafficking. Democrats and Republicans have plenty of differences here in Springfield, but more often than not, they do find common ground on certain critical issues facing the state of Illinois, issues like human trafficking. Joining us on Illinois Lawmakers, two members of the Illinois Human Trafficking Task Force, Senate Republican Caucus Whip Karen McConaughey of uh, St. Charles and Democratic State Representative Robin Gable of Evanston. Good to have you both here on the program. Thank you. Good, Good to, to be, be here. here. You know, like a, a lot of folks, I thought I was aware of the issue of human trafficking, but it was only when one of our graduate fellows at the Simon Institute Institute brought me up to speed on the scope of the problem, I began to understand how seriously this impacts the state of Illinois. We're, what, number eight in the, in the country in terms of the seriousness of the problem? I would say it, it, we're more like number two because the city of Chicago and because we have a strong uh, transportation infrastructure, O'Hare is a traffic uh, mecca for moving uh, trafficking vi victims all across the country. So we play a very critical role in the fight against human trafficking here. We also have a high immigrant population, right. which is one of the factors in uh, creating a situation where this can happen. Well, we're, we're basically at the transportation crossroads of the entire country. You have the interstate system linking us from north to south and across east to west. And, uh, you know, in, it, the, the problem is different in different parts of the state. In southern Illinois, where I, where I call home, a lot of it centers around the truck stops and the mm -hmm. interstate highways mm -hmm. where there's prostitution issues. And it can also be uh, linked to uh, uh, people trafficking children uh, for drugs. Right, right. right or labor. Now, that's another aspect of this. A lot of the times we think about this in terms of child sexual exploitation, but the labor component of it is also, uh, is also there. Could you elaborate on that a little bit more? Well, it's, it, as you said, it's not limited to uh, just uh, trafficking individuals. And, and by the way, it's women, men, and children. So it's not just children, it's not just women. Men are also trafficked. Um, uh, you know, uh, servitude in, in a household. I mean, it can be as simple as that, that you think that there is uh, someone helping out in the, in the garden is actually somebody who is kept there against their will. Uh, that's more common than we realize. But all it of these, yeah, go ahead. It can also be forced labor in, uh, for example, the restaurant industry, where they can bring people in from Mexico, keep them, and, uh, and have forced labor. And when the governor uh, signed the, the, some of the initial legislation on this, he called it uh, what a lot of people have, have basically come to the conclusion it's a modern form of slavery, mm -hmm. any, any way you look at it. So there are a couple of different bills out there. One creates the uh, actual task force of which you are members of. You're getting ready to hold hearings around the state of Illinois. Uh, I, I assume part of that is in, in, in part to, to try to get a, a grip on how things play out, let's say, in Chicago, the suburbs, and then, then right. downstate. Right. Well, I think it's it's really important to understand what were the reasons behind creating the task force in the first place. So we've, we've acknowledged that we have a big problem here in Illinois, uh, but what we don't have, and people would be surprised to know, we have no coordinated effort between law enforcement at the, at the federal, state, and local level that is statewide. So a, a, there's a task force that operates in the city of Chicago yes. and Cook County that's very effective, but obviously we have uh, victims trafficked all across the state. So we need to 
establish protocols. In our districts, mm -hmm. our law enforcement agencies many times don't have an established protocol of what to do when they come across a human trafficked victim. I think the other issue that the task force is going to address is awareness. Mm -hmm. So that Paul Simon's study showed that people don't think trafficking is an issue in their area. People in Chicago, people downstate, they just don't think it's an issue. And I think that we need to create more awareness to let people know and, and uh, be, uh, you know, pay attention to it. Uh, law enforcement, as you say, those, is those agencies are on the front line. So it, it's, it's a matter of coordination to make sure that the information gets passed uh, back and forth. It's also an issue of training. How do I know what I'm looking for to possibly identify a, a victim of human trafficking? I, I saw, I mean, you probably saw the story, I think it was on MSNBC not long ago, of a, an airline uh, flight attendant who saw something unusual with a young woman on the plane and she got to asking questions and turned out the person was uh, being being trafficked right you know uh, that's an interesting storyline uh, the woman who created who who created a protocol is working with all of the airlines across the country to train uh, flight attendants and all staff to begin to look for to know what to look for and those are that's that's a typical example of what we're talking about at all levels mayors for instance uh, at the municipal level um, making sure that your ordinances reflect registration to prevent massage parlors that are a great um, uh, area where people are trafficked to create some sort of standard so they can so that you can assure that no one is being trafficked through those ins those the victims of human trafficking are often, if they're involved in prostitution for example, uh, a lot of the focus actually ends up uh, punishing them instead of the people who are impressing them into this situation. So that's kind of a major shift I've seen in how this issue is being addressed around uh, the rest of the country. So there's a shift to that. We've passed laws since 2006 and many of them are addressing that issue to protect victims of, uh, of uh, trafficking. What about foreign born victims who are applying for T non-immigrant status? That's another area that you've been working on, right, Senator. Well, again, it just it, it's uh, whether they're uh, uh, individuals or young girls from our communities or they're foreign born, the protocol and how we approach it is very, very similar. You first have to get them out of the situation, but then you have to work. What do you do once you get them out of the situation? We really don't in this state have enough resources to provide rehabilitation for those who have been victimized. Sort of an aftercare kind of uh, situation. Right. Exactly. Um, you know, a lot of these folks, as you say, uh, when they come into the situation, they're destitute, they don't have any resources, and there's really no uh, infrastructure in place. Uh, state of Illinois, of course, uh, going two years without a budget, how do we even begin to start to get, get our heads around that and develop the kinds of care that these folks need? Well, one of the bills we passed did provide some funding for victims of, uh, of exploitation. Um, so that funding, I think, believe it's still available. But, um, you know, we need to work with a lot of the community groups who are doing this. There are a series of them who are, and uh, we need to help them get the funding they need either uh, through the state or through private sources as well. I've been watching a lot of this, of course, take place in the Chicago area. Cook County Sheriff Tom mm -hmm. Dart has been very mm -hmm. involved in this, this whole thing. And we're starting to see, you mentioned public awareness, uh, Senator. Mm -hmm. uh, we're starting to see the billboards go up in the Chicagoland area. Is, is that going to be uh, an effective uh, means of countering this? Well, I think if you if you know just a few years ago, five take five years ago, people didn't even like we said earlier, people didn't even understand that there was a problem right in our own communities. Awareness is coming around very quickly, and continued continued efforts to. Uh, educate people, not just the people who are on the government side of it, but local community groups, church groups, kids in school. Very important to get in early into the education system and educate children so that they uh, understand a little bit about uh, uh, what what are the triggers that would draw them into trafficking and know what to look for. The internet is, is a, a good source of, of um, finding these young victims. And I think people need to educate our, our youth, and particularly, you know, teenage years are very difficult years to begin with, and uh, they need to understand that to be very careful about who they meet on the internet. This is a, this is a good example of where uh, both parties can work together on an issue of common concern. Another one that uh, just, I believe it's in the governor's desk right now, is automotive automatic voter registration. That was a bill that you were working in the House? 
Yes, actually the bill is now in the House. We, okay. The Senate passed their bill. But we're working very closely with the governor's office uh, this year. Last, last year it was uh, vetoed by the governor, but this year um, it looks like we're going to be able to uh, put a bill together that can be signed. What essentially does it do? So this bill does two things. One, one it breaks down barriers to, to voter registration. There are about two million people here in the state who are eligible but not registered. Uh, and two, it really uh, establishes us as, as part of the 21st century by using data exchanges to share information from local, from uh, the Secretary of State's office, from state uh, departments, Human Services, Department of Natural Resources, to share that data with the uh, State Board of Elections so those people can be automatically registered to vote. There have been some concerns on the Republican side of the aisle over the bill. Are you basically sanguine with that now that, uh, that it moves across uh, and becomes law eventually? Well, I think it will become law eventually. Uh, I, I'm not sure what the governor plans to do, whether he's planning on signing it or not. But we do have to make, make the availability to vote uh, accessible to people in the state. Um, I can't leave without uh, asking you, uh, Senator McConaughey, about uh, where things are with the grand bargain in the Illinois State Senate. The uh, Senate Democrats moved a number of pieces of that uh, package this week, right. some with Republican support, some right. without. I, uh, it looks like one of the major ha hang-ups right now is on property tax relief. Yeah, we there, and, and yesterday there were three bills that v there were Republican votes on. Uh, those were areas that we have reached agreement. We continue to work on a number of different areas education funding, balanced budgets, and as you mentioned, uh, property tax reform. We have more units of local government than any other state About in the 7, country. Yep. Sure. <laughs> and in addition to that, we have in parts of our state some of the highest property taxes in the entire country. And so one of the biggest reasons why people are leaving our state is the high property tax. One of the reasons why businesses are leaving are the high property tax. So getting their arms around that and finding ways to consolidate government and reduce our property tax is a big issue. In the last 30 seconds or so, we have Senate Democrats who are willing to go to two years in a property tax freeze. Senate Republicans would like four years, and the governor would like to make it permanent. Right, right. And somewhere in between, we're going to find a solution. So you, you, there, there were dueling news conferences this week. You think you can get it done in the next 12, 13 days? I think so. I think everybody's motivated in, on both sides of the aisle and in both chambers. We, want, we all want the same thing. We want the right thing for the people of Illinois. It's just we have different ideas about how to get there. Senator McConaughey, Representative Gable, thank you both for your thank time you. on Illinois Lawmakers. We certainly appreciate it. That's it for this week. We'll be back with continuing uh, coverage of the spring session of the Illinois General Assembly next week here on Illinois Lawmakers. From all of us at Illinois Lawmakers, so long from Springfield.